KCRW sponsors include A24, presenting Moonlight, a film chronicling three chapters in the life of a young black man, discovering his identity and experiencing first love as he moves from childhood into manhood. In theaters now. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. Ted Cruz wrapping the bacon around the <laughs> semi-automatic weapon to cook it. I understand that trade is not a sexy issue. Nobody knows where the Republican Party is going to land. I mean, it's kind of like a country road. No one knows where it will end. In many ways, Marco Rubio is the Michael Jordan of American politics. I'm Warren Olney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. Well, you probably ask yourself, what do suicidal tendencies, infectious grooves, and Metallica have in common? Well, they have in common my guest, bassist, and film producer, Robert Trujillo, but they also have something else in common with the bands Rush and The Police and Red Hot Chili Peppers, that they were all influenced by Jaco Pastorius. Robert is the producer and the writer of the documentary Jaco, which was directed by Stephen Kijak and Mr. Paul Marchand. Robert, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Elvis. I have to tell you, I used to test girlfriends by giving them a copy of Jaco, and if they didn't click with that album, it wasn't going to go anywhere. Right. I mean, I can still name the track listing from that side A, you know, with right. Donna Lee and oh, Come yeah. On, Come Over, the last time Sam and Dave recorded together. Oh, yeah. And Crew Speak Like a Child and Beautiful Portrait song. of Tracy. And yeah. Tell me about the first time you heard Jocko. Well, the first time I heard Jocko would have been actually set 1978 or 77. A friend of mine who I used to play music with, and at the time I didn't know if I was a bass player or a drummer or a keyboard player. I just loved music. And my my good friend, his name was David Santana. He had an older brother, Caesar, And Caesar was a bass player. And Caesar actually was telling me about this guy, Jaco Pastorius, you know. And, and at the time, it was mostly one word, Jaco. Jaco. You know, which was also really cool and mysterious. And I believe... Actually, I believe the first track that he turned me on to was Teen Town. Oh, from and the Weather Report. Weather Report, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then from there, I, I heard Portrait of Tracy, and it really blew my mind. You know, So it was Weather Report and the Heavy Weather album that sort of initiated me. And then and that was the weather, and, and Heavy Weather was his first uh, record with that, Weather that, Report. That was the, the second one. The first one was actually Black Market and then Heavy Weather. So... I just couldn't believe it. What it was is when you hear an instrument sound like something you've never heard before, it really carries with you. It has that impact. And specifically with Portrait of Tracy, I could not understand what that was because I knew what harmonics were, but I didn't know that you could actually create a composition with you know, with, with with those type of notes and that technique. So that blew my mind. And then in 1979, I actually saw Jaco Pastorius perform at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium with Weather Report, and it changed my life. Because one of the things that's so great about that, and as a drummer, you would respond to this, is he was really melodic as a bassist, but it was also, as the documentary points out, a really percussive sound. You could hear how much the conga influence the the sustain, but also the way he tapped the bass. Correct. His technique was very unique. Um, let's get into uh, Birdland specifically. He's playing a fretted bass, you know, and he's also, you know, utilizing the harmonics, bending false harmonics and incorporating that into the melody. And um, he was just such a great collaborator and such a unique creative individual. And he always left his mark, whether it was with Weather Report or Joni Mitchell the other thing that fascinated me was on his solo records, they were always very diverse. You know, it wasn't like one, like, I mean, he could have made one, well, he could have made an album that was sort of one style, like say, Come On, Come Over, which I believe is one of the funkiest, soulful R&B tracks classic. And he could have done that, you know, for a whole album, like similar to sort of Tower of Power or something. But he didn't. He'd give you classical. He'd give you world music. He'd give you 
edge and Well, the attitude. first song on that, on that side is the cover of the Charlie Parker, Donna Lee. Donna so Lee. You, you, those four songs I named on side A right. of that album are such different songs exactly. from that solo piece to Come On, Come Over, right. to the orchestral thing with that beautiful Herbie Hancock playing oh, yeah, on, yeah, on yeah. Speak yeah. Like a Child yeah. to Porch the Tracy. I mean, right. they're such different songs. It, it, exactly. And that... And what that proved to me, or at least taught me, is that as a musician, as a creative individual, there are no rules. And it's the same thing that I think Frank Zappa taught me, you know. And, and But I was way more influenced by Jocko. And that's why I had a band like the Infectious Grooves, where, you know, we were incorporating jazz and punk. Definitely more on the, on the funk side of the spectrum, but... At that time, I wasn't learning Jocko's songs note for note, which is probably a good thing because I don't think he necessarily wanted people to do that. I think he wanted to, to you to take the uh, the tools and the ingredients that he provided and create your own recipe, and that's what I did with the Infectious Grooves. Until this day, I tell you, I still have people coming up to me celebrating that music and you know when are you guys going to play again you know so it still holds up when are you guys going to play again by the way uh, i don't know we actually did a couple shows last year and it was a lot well, that's of just fun. a couple shows that's not a tour that's not no, we just a did... record that's not what we're waiting for no yet. no a couple shows we did last year was super fun you know i think for where i'm at in my life now i'm i'm 51 and, uh, and, you know, I, I have an 11-year-old son and a 9-year-old daughter and my wife, Chloe. You know, you, you try to find that balance between Metallica, family, and then Jocko's almost like another band of mine now. You know, it's like <laughs> another child or, or, you know, another family member. It's been a long haul and uh, an incredible ride to make a film like this. For me, at least, it was sort of jumping in the water and learning to swim. I never made a movie quite like this, and you have to take, it's like going in the jungle and navigating the terrain. You're going to get attacked by mosquitoes. You're going to, you, you know, you, you put your foot in that, in, in the water, you know, you're going to get attacked by piranhas, but at the same time, you're going to see beauty and light along the way, and at the end of this journey, you know, it, it all kind of makes sense, and and uh, it's a beautiful thing. My guess was making making a movie sound like South Florida, where Jaco Pastores is from. <laughs> That's true. Is Robert Trujillo? He's yeah. the producer and writer of the new documentary Jaco on the life of Jaco Pastores. You may also know him from a little art house band called Metallica. He has a reminder <laughs> on his phone in case you don't know about that. But I thought I think what's so interesting about the film to me is all these influences. I mean, seeing him as a kid playing with Wayne Cochran and the CC Riders, and then right. just seeing all these different techniques. And there's one part where his daughter Mary says when she was out with him, you know, that he would hear the music in the birds and hear music in the breezes in the trees. And that's the thing. You can sort of hear that his influences came from everywhere. You couldn't just pinpoint him one thing right. because he played the bass like it was a lead, uh, but he also played it in a really harmonic way, which right. was unlike the way all these bass players that we're talking about, like Larry Graham and Stanley Clark played. I mean, they were mm -hmm. more keeping the bottom, mm -hmm. but he played it like he was on top of rhythm, but also keeping rhythm. Yeah, he... He well, he was a composer first, and um, is that what you think makes him different? That he's primarily a composer. Yeah, I mean, as a composer, you know, you hear music in a different way. You know, you it's it's a comp it's a wide spectrum. There are a lot of melodic moments, um, so the so the instrument would now have a voice. As as you'll find in the film, he was a great piano player. I mean, he he could play. It's not it wasn't you know he, he was he was a great drummer. You know, he originally started out as a drummer, and um, and that is very is very apparent in his ability to uh, rhythmically, you know, and how he plays as a bass player, which is important. And with that, you know, he was able to gain the, uh, the this technique where it involves sef separation. So you're able to rhythmically attack your instrument and the technique of that and the feel of that, but then also sing in a rhythmic way so you're kind of you know it's almost like you know rubbing your head in in your in your stomach you know it's it's is it ambidextrous or yes, you know yes, what i mean yes, it's yes, like sure. there's something else going on there what germans have to be because you have to keep your feet going at the it, same time you got your hands it's basically like having your body doing two different things at once exactly and jocko some people may or may not know was a really great juggler I mean, and there's a clip of him juggling in the film yeah and joni mitchell gave us that footage she had these 
these uh, reels of tape in her possession, and she let let us uh, transfer them di to digital. And lo and behold, there's Jocko juggling backstage, and you've got Pat Metheny watching, and Don Elias, and all the members of the band. And I, I received an email literally about th three days ago, and it was a clown from the Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey. And they train in Florida. Yeah, and, and this person told me that in 1982, there was this guy who came out to hang out with the clowns, and they didn't know they didn't know that he was the bass player of Weather Report. He just was, you know, Ham hey, Jocko, and he was a really nice guy, and he just wanted to hang out with with the troupe, and he wanted to learn, and he wanted to embrace the juggling, and he wanted to 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 really just hang with these guys, you know. And that's what he did. To me, it's an example of his character and his personality. Whether it was with, you know, other musicians like Joe Diorio or you know Pat Martino. He really wanted to be a part, like just to hang with them and learn and be present with them and embrace what they knew. You know, and the guy says specifically, we knew who Weather Report was, but we did not know that he was the bass player of Weather Report because he never, he never told us. And you, know, you didn't have the internet actively back then, so you couldn't just go, oh, let me check this this out or whatever. That was the thing that was great for me was there was so much mystique to Jocko, when I saw him in '79, I didn't know what I, what to expect. It was a uh, fascinating to see him play live and to see him um, take command of the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. I mean, no disrespect to the other members of the band because they're all tremendous in their own way, but he really did sort of commandeer that performance. And there was a lot of different types of. I always say this, you know, he. He could really captivate an audience on so many levels, and there were so many different types of styles of people, you know, whether it was the jazz community or, or punkers or heavy metal musicians, you know. Um, I remember even seeing, like, some of my skateboard and surfer buddies there, you know. It really? was just Yeah. It was that it, kind of mix. It was that kind of a mix. And, you know, again, being 51 years old, I was just old enough to experience his performances. I saw him play four times. I had an encounter with him in 1985. What was the encounter? What happened? Um, there was a guitar show in Los Angeles called the Los Angeles Guitar Show, and it was in Hollywood. It was at the Merlin Hotel, which now I believe it might be a Holiday Inn Express or something like that. And each room was delegated as a, a, sort of a, a room for a specific guitar company or an amp company, or a... So it was basically like a convention. Yeah, it was basically like a poor man's NAM show, you know. Okay. And it was interesting because I was in this one room, and I heard this incredibly loud... It was almost annoying. It was so loud. The walls were shaking, and it was it was clearly some guy was, <laughs> was, was trying to create an earthquake or something. I mean, it was... Or at least scare people, because it worked. And uh, I went in the room. It was literally across the hall from the room I was in. And I was the first one in there, and it was Jocko. Jocko was sitting there on a chair playing a bass, of course. And uh, there was like a guitar rep guy that was standing above him holding another guitar, another bass. And I basically just took a knee, and I, I about, I don't know, eight feet away, I just took a knee, and I just watched him play. And the room filled up. Within a couple minutes, it was packed. And we were all very excited. It was ni it was 1985. Did so you get to talk to him? I, you know, I didn't even talk to him. I just sat there and I was watching him play. And he, and he stared at every one of us. He didn't smile. He just stared at us. And he kept playing and he was quoting like Jerry Jamat bass lines and some of his own. And, and, and Jerry's and he, in the film. He, yeah, and he's in the film. So it was, it was a very special moment for me. But I kind of kicked myself in the butt because I... Um, like now, I would have, of course, invited him to lunch. And now knowing that he's all about the ocean, I mean, he really is, I, I would have invited him to go body surfing or let's go to the beach. That you know, and Funny thing was, though, his girlfriend at the time walked in the room and she was beautiful, but she had on a hoodie, like a hoodie, uh, kind of like an OP, kind of a surfer type of look. And she had two beers 
in her pocket. I'll never forget that. She had one in each pocket, and she said, come on, Jackal, let's go. And he goes, okay. And he just got up and left us all there in the room <laughs> with our jaws dropped. And that was my encounter. You know, it's funny because those things have happened in my life and in my career with, with a few people here and there. And it's like, man, you had the opportunity to hang and you didn't. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I've learned to be less shy, at least. Well, my guest who I'm getting a chance to hang with is Robert Trujillo. You may know him as the bassist. I'm going to check his phone. Oh, yeah, the band is Metallica. Uh, <laughs> he's producer and writer of the documentary, Jocko. It's the treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. Take KCRW with you on one of our smartphone apps. Available for the iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry. You can stream KCRW live, listen to podcasts, and all our news and music streams. Learn more and download at kcrw.com slash apps. Welcome back. It's the treatment. I've got the plague that makes my booty move. I'm sitting across from <laughs> Robert Trio. Yeah. He is the basis for the band Metallica. He's also a producer of the documentary Jocko, and he also wrote the film. As you were talking, though, one of the things I was thinking about, if you even listen to Birdland really closely, you can almost hear him humming the bass lines. Right. I mean, you can actually hear that. Yeah. I'm singing along with that. Yeah. Again. And mm -hmm. just watching the film, one of the things that I got from this, and I wonder if you did too, is that he could do so much stuff. It's almost like he had too much energy to be contained by just one thing. I agree. I mean, he was a daredevil, or as Wayne Shorter calls him, he, he refers to him as a superhero. And he seems to be the type of individual that no matter what, the situation is he always wanted to create positive energy. So one of the difficult tasks in this, and I'll, I'll jump ahead on this, is just create, was creating the balance in the story because with this story, it could be very, very, very dark, very tragic. Because it has a very dark and tragic ending. Exactly. But at the same time, there's a celebration here too because he was su such a, uh, an incredible musician. We should and also say that he really broke through when he, his wife met Bobby Columbi, who produced that first album, and said, my husband is the world's greatest bass right, player. Right. And Bobby just kind of basically rolled his eyes, went okay, and yeah. then Jocko turned out to be the world's greatest bass player. Well, yeah, he could back it up, you know, and that was, <laughs> you know, there was that confidence, like Muhammad Ali, who was definitely somebody that he looked up to, or Bruce Lee, where he could back it up. You know, what I have to say in regards to, on the creative end, you know, Paul Marchand, my director, was really, really amazing in creating that balance, in writing, in, in bringing that to life. You know, it's, it's very delicate. And, you know, you, you really, when you take something like this on, you know, it can't happen in one year. And that's why it's taken so long, because you have to really get in there and you have to get into the edit. You have to experiment. You've got, we've got so many different segments so, you know, I always have to credit him as being like a, a right-hand man. And same thing with Johnny Pastorius, Jocko's eldest son. I met Johnny Pastorius in 1996 when I was touring through Fort Lauderdale with Metallica. And the interesting thing is, I mean, I'm sorry, with, um, so, with so. Ozzy Osbourne okay. at that time. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's interesting because one of the first things that I told him was, you know, someday – you know, you should make a film about your father. You know, his his story is so important and his relevance and influence is very wide and vast. There's so many different types of musicians, gospel musicians, punk musicians, and I knew that Flea was into him. And, you know, of course, we come to find that Getty Lee. That was he, shocking to you know, me that Getty Lee was yeah, influenced by I him. mean, and the other thing that's shocking is, is Jocko actually had a connection to some of these musicians that I didn't even know about. Uh, and, you know, some of these stories I just kind of heard recently, you know, pe pe that's the thing is when you make a film like this, of course, people come out of the woodwork and they start sharing their stories with you. And, and one thing I learned early on was, um, you know, it, it's almost impossible. Well, it isn't impossible because it would have to be a second DVD or something or a second, second film. You could literally do a whole nother six hours on stories alone, you know, just stories alone. So initially I was like, oh, yeah, we'll get great stories and we're going to do this film. But no, there's just so many and they're all great. 
I can I can think of one specific uh, story that really really kind of hit home with me. There's a drummer called Frankie Bonali, and he plays in a band called Quiet Riot. You have to explain Quiet Riot. Uh, okay, for Quiet Radio. Riot. <laughs> yeah, is a is a heavy metal band that was very popular in the '80s and very well groomed. <laughs> and um, yes, lots of hair. <laughs> and, and Frankie approached me at a screening we had done about six months ago in Los Angeles. And uh, it was a relatively small screening, and I had never met him before, and he looks at me, and I could see the, the passion in this guy's eyes, you know, legitimate. And he says, Robert, I'm Frankie Benali. I play drums in Quiet Riot. I have to tell you, Jocko was my friend. I worked at a record store in South Florida, and Jocko would come into the record store, and he would hang out with me. And he, he, and sometimes, you know, and he kind of laughed, you know, he said Jocko would try and borrow his albums. <laughs> He'd try and take his <laughs> albums, you know, out with him. He goes, but he was such a beautiful person. He would bring me mangoes. He would gift me with mangoes. He would make me take a break and have me go out and play beach volleyball with him. Go, you know, he'd make me, come on, would you, come on, come on, let's go to the beach, man. We're going to go play volleyball. And he just had this beautiful energy. And, you know, Frankie's telling me this, and you could see that it's real and it's true. And, you know, I, I just, I hear these stories from these different musicians, and they're of all styles. It's not like, he didn't single out, you know. I mean, I'm sure he would have done that with with a contractor or, a, you know what I mean, or, or well, the anybody, janitor or sure. something, you know, that kind of energy. Maybe not the attorneys, he probably wouldn't go there, but <laughs> he would you know, it, it, yeah, but, you might not have such good things to say about uh, Warner Brothers, yeah, but I mean, the thing I mean, that you get from all this, though, I want to ask you about this, is yeah. that and it comes across the movie, is that he had this enormous appetite for life. Right. But it wasn't this kind of selfish energy. He wanted to share that appetite with everybody. Right. That's what I've learned, you know, and at the same time, you know, you do have the delicate balance of bipolar, you know, uh, syndrome, which is something that I learned a little more about. And... I am less judgmental of, of people when I see them, you know, homeless people. And, I mean, I spent a lot of time at Venice Beach. There are a lot of homeless people at Venice Beach. But everybody has their story and their reason for what's going on in their life, you know. And back in, at that time for Jocko, it, it, you know, it wasn't like – it was different than it is now to a certain degree in and terms of – And there's a lot of, more awareness and empathy yeah, for that kind of thing. We it, should say the reason you're talking about this is yeah. over the course of less than two years, he went from being on top of the world – to being homeless and sort of taken down by his bipolar disorder, which led to him being a homeless guy. But the bottom line is, you know, again, you know, in this lifetime, we have very special individuals who bless us with their life and show us the way, you know, or help show us the way, be it creativity, you know, art, you know, ideas, just J Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, you know, but then there's other people that have have blessed us, and they're not here for a long time, you know what I mean? And we have to learn from those individuals, and Jocko was, was one of those individuals, very it's even, special. It's really sad, because yeah. at one point in the movie, he basically said he thought he would die at the age of 34. Yeah, and he, and he you know, I would say he had a vision, and um, he expressed that to, to Bobby Thomas Jr., who was the percussionist for Weather Report, and very, very close to Jocko, and very close to Joe Zawano, and a very spiritual man as well. And, you know, there are individuals that can see things that we don't see or see the future in a certain way. I, I feel like um, there's been a lot of sort of miracles that have happened along this journey, and uh, some of it's unexplainable. But, and what, um, what were you thinking? Well, for instance, at, at a certain point in the journey, like over the course of one year, you think you're finished, and then all of a sudden new treasures would appear, you know, like – Maybe there's audio of never before heard Jocko interview where he's telling his own life story. That's a blessing, but at the same time, you've got to re-edit the whole film, you know? So you go back, you re-edit, and all of a sudden there's photographs that appear from the vault or Havana Jam footage that Sony had. And I would say uh, two huge, huge moments for us were actually getting Joni Mitchell on board, which would have been year four into the project, you know. I can't imagine the film without that, that great series of albums they did together. Don Juan's Reckless Daughter and Hegira and Mingus. I mean, exactly. That's, that's a whole... Exactly. You couldn't leave that chapter of the story out, could you? And, and exactly. It's so important 
to you know his career and his story. And then Jerry Jamat, Jocko's favorite electric bass player, he moves to Los Angeles from Alabama. No one had heard from him. I mean, these are the things. Some of the things. There's more, you know. But it, it's just amazing, you know. How did this happen? What, what, you know, and 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 why, you know? Why did it not happen before? I think things happen for a reason. And uh, there wasn't a moment that I, there isn't a minute that I haven't thought about him during the making of this this film. And same thing goes for Paul, uh, my director. You know, he, we talk about it all the time. You know, just you know, wake up in the middle of the night and Jocko's there. You know, you're, he's, you know, you're thinking about new ideas or you're trying to kind of, uh, you, you know, you're getting a message or whatever. I, I again, you know, there are a lot of unexplainable moments in this journey and uh you know i'm just happy to have to have been a part of it and uh um, and to be able to you know have committed with passion to this and it's you know making documentary films is is important and special and i and i always really i have to to uh have just nothing but mad respect for documentary filmmakers because a lot of the times they're self-financed, you know, they're not, it's not like a blockbuster film, you know, a Terminator. It's, 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 it's a calling. I mean, you just, you're, you're committing your life to it and you're not really making any money yet. You're not, you take no. a little bit of money for this thing that could potentially take six years and if you're really committed to it, you can't do anything else. Right. And I, and I ran, actually ran out of money when I was getting close to post-production. I'm still trying to, I'm still paying for stuff, but, um. For me, you know, taking this on was all centered, has been centered around passion for all of us, every one of us who's been involved in this journey. I mean, my, my director of photography, Roger D. Giacomi, I went to school with him. I mean, I've known him since high school. Wow. And he, he joined the team. Brian Risner, who commandeered all the sound design for this film, he was Jocko's sound man, front house sound for Weather Report and Word of Mouth. And he was also very much a part of the recordings, you know, which happened at Devonshire Studios. And, and, and the interesting thing about Devonshire Studios is that's where I recorded with Infectious Grooves and Suicidal Tendencies. And that's where Jocko recorded you know his his weather report albums so th there's there's always these weird little kind of interesting connections you know <laughs> i i work a lot over at a and m studios which is now called henson studios that's like my second home and that is where jocko recorded with Joni mitchell you know his era and you know all these wonderful albums i think Joni did like 16 albums there you know so it's it's you know this journey in life and how you sort of make connect the dots here and there and, and you know who knows why they happen or for what reasons but um you know i feel it's been a, a very spiritual journey for me and and I, and I love the family you know john and mary and felix it, at times it's been complicated but i get it now you know i know why there's a reason for it because they want it to be right it was always important for me to make sure that the family is is happy and that they feel you know connected to this film because his family was so important to him very much so yeah so along the way you know yeah we've been schooled by them and kind of you know at the same time I've got to respect my filmmaker um, and my director you know with, with Paul Marchand and some of the others just to you know so there's a delicate balance and for me really try to to be patient and keep keep that balance in check and I, I think I learned a lot from being in bands, you know, and dealing with um, some of the various personalities in my career. But I'm very pleased with the uh, with the film. I it exceeded what I ever would have imagined. Uh, it's a it's a definitely a worthwhile journey, and it's a really a miraculous film. And we're out of time, Robert. You have to come back just to talk about whatever you want to. You're more than welcome here. Thank anytime. you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My guest, who has a pretty melodic voice himself, is Robert Trujillo, <laughs> known best as the bassist for Metallica. The film that he produced and wrote, the beautiful documentary, is Jocko, the story of Jocko Pastorius, the incredibly multi-talented bassist. Our recording engineer here at NPR West is Leo Delarge. The show's mixed by Ken Yor. It's edited by Blake White, who's associate producer. I got a bunch of albums for Robert to sign. It's the treatment.
catch up on past episodes of the treatment, go to KCRW.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. Da-da.